Greetings, comrades, and welcome to the Eastern Border. Now, I'm, I'm working on an episode about uh, the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, and its meaning both inside, well, our Eastern Border territories and otherwise, because I've, uh, I've gotten some comments that I should be making more analytical, analytical episodes, and I'll be on to that, except, you know, right now, I still feel quite attached to the war. But I'm working on it, and, and I'm listening to you, so don't you worry about that. And uh, we also have an episode coming in very soon with the Secret Police podcast. He, he he just finished his whole series of Russian secret services, secret police things, and we did a bit, a bit more of a philosophical discussion on that. So that's upcoming very soon as well. What I'd like to say today is that, um, again, we have a tragedy in Israel, a full-scale war, so to speak, as they call it. And it's a bit of a mess what's happening here. Russian mainstream propaganda are now celebrating this whole thing. Ahmed Dusmanov, a Russian fighter, I don't think he's MMA, maybe he is. He's the Olympic champion in one of those grappling styles. He uh, celebrated the death of Jews, which is funny since you can, since you kind of realize that they were all for denazification of Ukraine back when. However, there are a lot of people, both in Ukraine and outside and everywhere else, who are just saying that Russia has somehow coordinated this whole thing. Mostly Russian opposition journalists. By the way, we'll get to them as well later on. We have a, I have a weird debate to comment on today. But um, yeah, I, I'd like to put this one to rest. Uh, put in might do many things, but organizing Hamas attacks, uh, he benefits from them, but I don't think he really did this specific one. See, the thing is, they did have fun little activities around with, with, um, with Hamas and with Taliban and everything. For one, Russia does not recognize Hamas as a terrorist organization, no matter what they have said before and everything. And uh, they've, been, they've been in official visits to Moscow. They have been working together. But I really don't exactly know how, how close they are really. Russia was involved in negotiations in the Middle East uh, by the way, uh, trying to get itself sorted out and but they weren't as close and who knows how they're feeling about all the situation because well, Russia could benefit but I highly doubt Russia did this at this point. Certainly there could be some Russian money involved into this matter Russia could have sold some weapons, but not because of this attack, it's just because that's what just they they basically do. And, well, we shouldn't be taking all this way too lightly. What should be taken seriously, however, is that um, an unprecedented number, as reported by United24 Media, number of freight cars, at least 73, were, report, were recorded at a railway facility in the city of Tumangan near the North Korean-Russian border. So there is movement happening there as well. This might be like South Korea, like North Korea has started to supply Russia with weapons and ammunition. And then, you know, quite probably Russia has just sold it to Hamas because someone needs to work with them. I mean, with Russia at this point, which is a bit iffy. But currently, yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a mess. And just to finish this one up, because I really don't feel like I have the capacity and the skills needed to talk a lot about this whole Israel situation. Well, we have, uh, thankfully, our friend of Igor Girkin, Maxim Kalashnikov, who decided to chime in about this whole situation. And he also comments about how the Russian propaganda are reporting all this stuff and what's going on there. Quote, The Russian Federation, and this is from Maxim Kalashnikov, is not a subject in the current circle of global chaos. Propaganda can shout as much as it wants about a masterly geopolit geopolitical game, but in reality, Moscow is like a sliver of events. Yes, of course, the West will be detracted from Ukraine for some time. Yes, some cream of the crop will come from rising world oil prices. Until this rise sends the global economy into a severe recession. But, first, the Russian Federation is completely unprepared for the impact of a global economic downturn if it happens due to rising energy prices and depression in the American economy. Russian budget revenues will fall sharply. But industrialization, meaning the ability to live not only from raw materials, has not been carried out since 2000. The entire economic policy of the state is aimed at strangling non-resource production. The release of 
Weapons is an exception, but you can't go far with one weapon. With weapons alone, that is. In 1941, we were even more ready for testing. At least they managed to create a powerful industrial base and personnel. Now this is not the case, and demographically we have a complete Mariana Trench. The management caters, the organizers of the failures, are in place. Plus the brewing crisis with migrants which could explode in the face of a falling, with a falling commodity incomes. Number two. The West's distraction from Ukraine is not accompanied by Moscow's ability to quickly defeat Kiev. That is, to quickly destroy its rear and turn the Ukrainian armed forces into masses, into, into masses who are deprived from ammunition, fuel, food and control. The Russian Federation was unable to mobilize, create a system of military socialism with the GOKO state defense community. And uh, it's not really either to suppress the air defenses of the armed forces of Ukraine with an air offensive campaign, paralyzing the enemy's rear, or for a large ground offensive. For this purpose, powerful and prepared reserves, equipped with everything necessary, have not been formed. In return, laxity, a sea of confusion and an, an inability to jump out of a positional trap. Even the likely resumption of nuclear testing will not help here. Impotence, you know, cannot be treated with plutonium. Personnel decides everything. If Iran can get benefits, then in the case of the Russian Federation, everything is much more sour. The exit from this sucking quagmire <laughs> uh, to some other position is not even planned. And then, uh, of course, the traditional conspiracy theories from um, Mikhail Kalashnikov and his buddies, because, of course, he blames the United States for this as well. Why wouldn't he? Quote, <clears throat> Even if we assume that the United States itself helped Hamas carry out Budyonovsk number 2 in order to lead to the fall of the government of military general Netanyahu, uh, because he obviously has no idea how the United States foreign relationships work, but whatever, and the establishment of a pro-American regime in Israel, there is also such a conspiracy theory. Uh, there is, he stated that thing, except, you know, the, in Israel there's already a pretty much pro-American government. It's like in most places, so it's weird. But then he just presumes this is true, thankfully, not himself defends this quote. Then, if this all is true, then, it, then is Moscow benefiting from this that much? No. If this crazy assumption is true, then the new government in Israel will begin, begin supplying Kiev with 155 millimeter shells and drones which you see does not in any way make uh, the situation easier for the Russian Federation. Well, I disagree here with Maxim Kalashnikov, but, you know, I like to have someone from that side who was at least half decent to argue against me. I think Putin uh, kind of thinks, well, let's just say it this way, Putin definitely thinks he is going to benefit from this somehow. I'm not sure he will, but the idea is that Putin benefits in the sense that Putin believes he's going to benefit from this. And there is a bit of chaos and some weapons deliveries might be delayed and Something like that. It all depends on how focused and careful we are everything. But carrying on from Maxim Kalashnikov, because he really has a long and interesting speech this time. Quote, For woe to the underdeveloped. Woe to the one who, like a dragonfly, sang the ranks red summer since 2000 without carrying out the industrial revival of the country. Did Stalin say in 1931 that the laggards were being beaten? Stalin, uh, Stalin on the tasks of business, uh, and he then kind of quotes Stalin on the tasks of business executives, quote, In the history of states, in the history of countries, in the history of armies, there have always been cases where there were all the opportunities for success, for victory, but they, these opportunities remained in vain, since the leaders did not notice these opportunities, did not know how to take advantage of them, and the armies suffered defeat. So, that's, that's the sort of idea. He's complaining that there might be some benefit to put in, and I believe that there could be one, but uh, again, it's either something very, very sneaky or something done by very much trickery, or that's something that uh, you can't really see immediately. Meanwhile, well, the usual thing happened. Vladimir Putin participated in the plenary session of the Valdai International Discussion Club's 20th annual meeting. By the way, it's also his birthday today, so that's fun. And Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov said the president's appearance would be very meaningful and important. In his speech, obviously, Putin criticized the West and its, quote, influence on the world, and discussed his vision for the world order. He's an answer, he then answered some questions, everything on Prigozhin's plane crash, the claims that uh, Russia had betrayed the Armenian people. So I wanted to focus on this, because he had this speech and brief and he answered some interesting questions, and... This might help us understand him slightly better. And this is just in brief over here because um, I'm taking the one from Medusa. 
instead of the one that's directly posted on the Kremlin's website. Because, oh boy, I'm not ready to read through all of that nonsense. As it was way too long and um, a lot of empty phrases there. But, you know, thankfully my colleagues at Medusa have somewhat condensed it, so that'll be fine. Quote from his main thesis. When we first met at the International Discussion Club 20 years ago, our country was entering a new phase of its de development. We used all our energy and goodwill to engage in the process of building a new, as it seemed to us, more just world. Our readiness for constructive cooperation was misunderstood by some as an admission that Russia was ready to follow someone else's path, ready to be guided by someone else's interests. All these years, we have repeatedly warned that such an approach would be fraught with the increased threat of military conflict, but no one wanted to hear us or listen to us. The arrogance of our so-called partners in the West was off the charts. The United States and its satellites embarked on a course of military, political, economic, cultural, moral, and value-based hege hegemony. What's a value-based hegemony? I do not know. The prosperity of the West was achieved by robbing the colonies for centuries. Uh, and this, the fact that they do the same, obviously, you know, it goes past way. It's just Moscow totally isn't... I will not even start with the hypocrisy. If you've been listening to this show for such a long for, for a long time enough, you, you probably understand all this, all this nonsense. Carrying on. The history of the West is essentially a chronicle of endless expansion. To a degree, yes, and now we're up into space too, which is quite nice. There must be a res response to the ever increasing mil military and political pressure. Putin uh, says, quote, I have said many times that we didn't start the so called war in Ukraine. We're trying to end it. The war, which the Kyiv regime started with the direct support of the West, is already in its tenth year, while the special military operation is aimed at stopping it. Except it isn't, except there was tons of... Uh, again, I'm not going to debunk everything. You know better than me at this point. The Ukrainian crisis is not a territorial conflict. The issue is broader and more fundamental. We are talking about the principles the new world order will be based upon. Well, now. The West always needs an enemy. Russia is Western politicians' favorite topic. The Western elite are trying to make everyone who, who acts independently into an enemy, whether it be China, India, Arab countries, or Muslims. The United States imposes its security and economic decisions on Europe. Western colleagues, especially from the United States, instruct others how to behave in very insulting ways. Who are you anyway? If it makes you want to say, open your eyes, the era of colonial rule is long over. Well, he'd actually agree with Mr. Putin, except that he doesn't understand that his country is way much more colonialistic than, uh, than everything else. And there was some um, Q&A questions about this whole situation. He was asked on uh, militarizing the Russian economy, and he, resp he responded, quote, We've increased defense spending, not just defense, but also security spending. It has more or less doubled. It used to be around 3%, now it's around 6 It's not true to say that we're overspending on guns and forgot about butter. Yes, you did. I'd like to emphasize that all previously announced development plans, achievements of strategic goals of the government's social obligations to the population are being fully implemented. Except, of course, that's a blatant lie, but, you know, whatever. Then he uh, complains about West military aid uh, to Ukraine and that, you know, as soon as any, any of that stops, Ukraine's done. But, you know, I don't think, uh, I don't think it'll be kind of uh, done everything. And uh, he commented when asked about European Council President Charles Michel's statement that Russia betrayed the Armenian people. And then he didn't really mention anything much except that stated, they're the ones to talk. We have a saying, it's the pot calling the kettle black. And I have a question about whom the European Council betray exactly, but whatever. Then he was asked about Odessa, whether or not it's a Russian city. And he responded, well, uh, again, very insensitive in a way to, to everything. Odessa is, of course, a Russian city, but it's a bit Jewish, just a tiny bit. I was there, and I can tell you it's more than just a tiny bit of that stuff, so it's a bit weird. But now the really important thing that's, that's happening here, because my buddy Evgeny Pergozin, once again, carries on uh, while well, doing weird things, even after his death. He was asked about Evgeny Pergozin's death, of course, and uh, he responded the following, quote, The question of what happened to the head of the private military company is probably in the air. The head of the, of the investigative committee told me the other day that grenade remnants were lodged into the remains of the bodies of those killed in the plane, cl plane crash. There was no external impact to the jet. It's an established fact resulting from an expert probe conducted by Russia's Federal Investigative Committee. Unfortunately, there was no examination for the presence of alcohol 
or drugs in the blood of the deceased. Although we know that following certain events, the FSB searched the company office and discovered not just $10 billion in cash, but also 5 kilograms in cocaine. In my opinion, such an examination should have been done, but it wasn't. Now, let me tell you, the examination of uh, if someone dies with their blood, about the, the alcohol and everything, yeah, that's the first thing you do. Except that, obviously, uh, really, nothing exactly came from this. And Yeah, you should have done this investigation, but we didn't. Whoopsies, the one time when you actually needed to do this stuff. So, coke and hand grenades, isn't it? Kind of, kind of stupid. I mean, this is just insane. And now, well, obviously, we have a reaction, which also is interesting, because I want to tie down these ties with Prigozhin. See, Putin's version of everything that killed Prigozhin mirrors what Telegram channel MASH, who's totally pro-Kremlin, and the newspaper Moskovsky Komsomolets, reported the day after the qua- crash, and just, this was widely known. They, they were the ones who wrote about careless handling of ammunition, and, and, and all the cocaine and everything, it's just insane. Now, that's the thing. They, uh, these Mos- Moskovsky Komsomolets stated that, quote, there are strict rules for transporting weapons. The grenades and fuses go separately. Prigozhin and his team knew this, of course, but his security guards always carried their weapons and ammo with them because of the constant threat to Prigozhin's life. In the heat of a fierce argument, maybe someone, maybe somebody dropped a grenade, then pin fell out and there was an explosion. This guy speculates. Now, the, the little tiny problem here being that you cannot accidentally throw down a pin from a hand grenade. It simply is not even possible. It's just crazy. Now, a combination of our favorite channels like Grey Zone wrote the following, quote, They're shooting up with their own drugs and blowing up midair, commenting on this is only going to make things worse. According to the president's version of events, Prigozhin and Nutkin, while either drunk or high, accidentally detonated the hand grenade which caused the crash. This, everyone is just crazy angry about this in comments. Pro-invasion channel Southern Front wrote the following. They write that they found five kilos of coke when searching Prigozhin's office, as if the entire Wagner group got high on the stuff. It's fucking sickening. We Russians either, either speak well of the dead or not at all. And this is just nonsense. You never know who might forget, but I'll remind you that two heroes of Great Russia died in this plane crash. These weren't junkies. And they knew their weapons better than their own fucking dicks. The story about them blowing themselves up is a joke and a farce. And, well... Obviously, here is uh, our friend Maxim Kalashnikov. Well, now everything's clear. Two uh, assholes, Prigozhin and Nutkin here, were playing with a grenade in a fight, and they pulled a pin or something. True, there was no examination to determine the content of alcohol and drugs in their bodies, although uh, any detective or investigator, even in the wild 90s, would have done this. First thing. Now, the thing is, with, with all these other things that happened, with, with all this statement and what, what's going on there. The problem is that, uh, you know, this is a little interesting thing here. Just a, just, just a, just a tiny thing that I, I, it keeps nagging me. No one at all really goes hard on criticizing Putin. No one says, no one really says much about, about that, well, except Maxim Kalashnikov, but he always does that. I highly, you know, I, I'm kind of surprised that he himself hasn't been arrested as uh, Igor Girkin has. But that's a mess. That's just a mess that uh, they that they basically just carry on, and they haven't really done a lot of uh, a lot of situation here. However, well, we have a bunch of bunch of weird situations here about everything that's that's going on and well I kind of think that this might be tied together with the events in uh, Israel as well because I like I said I don't think Putin organized this but he's trying to get some benefits out of the situation I wonder how he didn't make more anti-semitic comments knowing that he did so way before and now to put everything else in the context there was an Igor Girkin letter that I missed. I mean, seriously, I, d- I read those, but I somehow missed this one, and I read it today, and I hadn't put it on um, 
I hadn't put on this one. I only put one about Karabakh, but I hadn't really mentioned this one. So I'll uh, put this one in, in full because once again, hey, something new from, well, our best nemesis, Igor Gerkin himself. Oh yeah, but before I do that, thank you to everyone who's our Patreon of our show. If you would like uh, to support the show, please consider going to patreon.com slash eastern border and, you know, becoming our patron. And you can also join our Discord. That's not for patrons, just for everyone. Or if you'd like to just support the show with a one-time donation, you can just go to the easternboard.lv and click the donate button there. Note that in the easternboard.lv site and for my Patreons, all the shows come out without any ads. That is, well, without those little things that ACOS likes to stuff in there, which, you know, some people might find annoying. So, hey, you, it would be better for you if you just go and listen to that there and support the show because I'm not a huge fan of my old ads as well. This came, by the way, um, the letter, which I'm going to read to you now because I still don't know much about, uh, much about the whole monetizing thing. But the letter that I missed was how Putin, sorry, how Girkin on 29th of September analyzed the situation, the political one and his situation with the fronts and, and everything. And, uh, well, the reason why he wrote this was because of... Uh, Putin's meeting with Yevkurov and Troshev and the statement of the Defense Ministry that the Defense Ministry has no plans for mobilization activities. And, uh, well, additionally, this was written at the point where Girkin thought that the United States' assistance to maintain, uh, maintain Ukrainian combat cap capability would be kind of lowered, and that they, they, he noticed a narrowing and changing the directions of Ukrainian attacks, shifting efforts from areas where strategic successes were possible, theoretically, such as Miliopol, Mediatopol, Berdyansk, Mariupol, to the areas of Donetsk and Bakhmut and, and everything. Quote, the situation on the front at the moment, a strategic stalemate. Ukraine is unable to regain the lost territories with its own forces, while the Russian Federation is unable to clear the DNR, Kherson, and Zaporozhye regions from the Ukrainians. Actions of the Russian Federation. The Kremlin has decided with 99% probability to freeze the war until the elections, i.e. until March 2024. No actions related to a significant strengthening of the Russian Federation armed forces capable of seriously aggravating the social, economic, and domestic political situation in the country will be taken up until spring. The armed forces will continue their strategic defense on plus or minus existing borders, having as its only task to prevent the deep breakthroughs or sensitive operational successes of the enemy. The question of what will be the strategy for the next spring-summer campaign was put aside in a, a box of long-term problems. Perhaps in the hope of some events in the Ukrainian camp, which will ease the foreign policy, which will ease the foreign policy of the Russian Federation. You know, what if Trump succeeds or, or the like? That's what the Gidkin said. And uh, he is commenting now on on everything about U.S. and NATO. I can easily skip that part, really, because again, he really wrote this at the point where everyone thought that the United States will be basically just uh, quit doing everything. That needs to be do needs to be done, and uh, the part from this that I want to read is, is the following quote: "The United States is more than satisfied with the continuation of a sluggish war with no preponderance on, on either side. The, the the Russian Federation, Putin, is not ready to put everything on the line. Awesome, that's the way we planned it. Let him weaken little by little, then we won't be in a hurry. It's this position that explains the significant reduction in the amount of aid to Ukraine. Well, that didn't happen, so that's uh, that's nice." However, again, he just shows the real fear that these pros and war patriots have with um, the whole war situation and how they feel that things are going to go. Quote, I assume that a major military success in Ukraine, which he puts in air quotes, seems unnecessary and even maybe dangerous for the United States right now because it may provoke the Kremlin to raise the degree of confrontation and any decisive actions in preparation for the liquidation of Ukraine itself because he thinks Americans want to destroy Ukraine in general. And here he's mistaken, as he's been sitting in the prison for such a long time. No, Russia cannot increase the, increase anything at this point. They can maybe sort of maintain what they have, but an increase seems to be very unlikely. And uh, we're getting gone from what he writes. And this may be in the long run uh, affecting the situation in the United States and NATO itself, for which Washington is not ready now. Therefore, the logic is as follows. We will feed Ukraine a little at a time without scaring Putin, who is still relatively firmly seated and in control of the situation. We will give him the impression that we are close to surrendering Ukraine and are tired of war. When the time comes, we can easily ramp up supplies in a matter of weeks, while the Russians would need many months of preparation for a full-scale offensive. 
I believe the United States position is being lobbied covertly and overtly in the Kremlin by numerous supporters of reconciliation at any cost, i.e. surrender. All of them have stayed where they are. The official propaganda screams to the population of the Russian Federation that there will be no personal changes before and after the elections. And given the current uh, situation, they should not be expected from the word to go. And then he draws some conclusions. The Kremlin has completely lost, or even deliberately ceded, its foreign policy initiative and its waiting for the weather, as it allows VIP officials to take it easy or do nothing at all, which they do masterfully. In the United States, NATO is in no hurry to go anywhere, and no one is interested in the option of so-called Ukraine. For the coming months, probably, probably for the fall winter campaign, Gerkin here predicts position battles without significant changes in the strategic situation. Individual operations are possible on both sides for propaganda purposes. <laughs> About, you know, he just explains how, you know, Russian Federation can state that they're advancing and that Ukrainians can claim that they've gained some stuff. But not much else, according to Gerkin. Mutual exchange of blows on rear areas and infrastructures will continue and will increase. Its tension depends only on the scale of munitions productions in the Russian Federation and on receiving them from NATO for Ukraine. Bloody pull push about which, as the main danger I warned since the fall of 2014, has become our non-alternative reality. Unless a miracle happens, it will almost inevitably lead Russia to disaster and disintegration, in whole or in part. The reluctance of the Russian authorities to fight for real is understandable and justified as it poses a threat to their power, which was clearly demonstrated by the so-called Prigozhin Rebellion. However, swimming downstream will eventually lead, almost inevitably, to the same deplorable result, but already without options. And then, along with the collapse of the state, VIP elites will lose not only power and money, but also their lives. If not all of them, then very, very many of them, however. They do not believe in such a thing from the word absolutely. In the internal politi political aspect, I predict a gradual strengthening of repression against all those who do not keep up with the party, and it does not matter from which camp. Until the elections, they will try to disguise it. After Putin's yet another triumphant victory, it can't be otherwise this time. Variations are possible, although we can't expect a brutal dictatorship either. Putin is not good at it, as he can do absolutely nothing more than, you know, half measures. And of course, I do not, Girkin that is, do not take into account quite possible black swan events, which can radically change the picture in a matter of days, or even in hours, as it was in June. This was written, by the way, the day before the 40th anniversary of the murder of Prigozhin and Utkin. Now, there is a black swan event. It's in Israel, but Israel seems to be doing quite well and fixing everything fine. However, this is getting scary. More and more conflicts happening all over the place. More and more conflicts in the world and, well, more and more ruthlessness. I'm afraid that we're getting, we're getting this being like normalized. This has been entrenched into, uh, into our culture and uh, in our understanding to the point where it's hard to even remember and comprehend how it was like before. It's a bit sad, to be honest. There's not much that we can do about all the situation. Sadly, once again, I do have to say that uh, this is going to be one of those decades that we, that we just must somehow endure and keep informed. But like I said, you know, I'll be doing my best, and I'll be also doing as much of historical episodes this year as I can just to get my brain in order to be more healthy. So that should be fine. That's it for today. Das Vidanya Tvarishi. And as always, remember, happiness is mandatory.